at this table we have a champion and an MVP. Oh. I present to you a newly crowned Lithuanian sports journalist championship winner and the MVP of the tournament, August Ashulauskas, taking wow. the title away from wow. our team because we were the champions last year. Thank you, Ritas. Oh, uh, you played there as well? I did, course, I did. But for the other team. You know, uh, you know how they say in this term. Uh, you know how they say to, to, to win back to back is is difficult. It's hard. There's it's one thing to win uh, and it's a completely different thing to uh, protect the title. So we didn't uh, make it past the group stage. We were beaten by by these guys led by Ogis. Uh, so they're the new champs. Uh, I I stay there to watch their uh, performance in the semifinal and the final. It, the, the, this was actually pretty quality amateur basketball, I would say. I mean, the final was 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 pretty good. Uh, there were actually even tactical things like when you switch yeah. to zone defense, it probably it actually saved our. It probably from... saved you because you were down four or six. Down all uh, all game. For yeah, six yeah, yeah you were chasing them. So, uh, how? Uh, wh where do you rank this title in terms of your basketball <laughs> achievements? <laughs> <laughs> not very high, I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> so it's but, not your proudest achievement, right? <laughs> I mean, it's fun to win. I had fun with playing yeah. with my colleagues. It was the first time playing competitive basketball with my colleagues. Yeah. And uh, since both semifinal and final were close games, we won only by two points. And if it's confusing for you guys why Ritis and me weren't on the same team, it's because Ritis uh, played for uh, where the company where yeah, he I worked for the broadcaster yeah, for the broadcaster. So yeah. we were on different teams, but it was fun. I mean, playing with my colleagues uh, on a Saturday morning, uh, really nice. I'm, I was a little bit unhappy that Donatas couldn't manage to come and watch those games because I at know least that's... at least work as a scout yeah you know like scout, I, I scout the part, other teams i did my part on yeah. the eve of the game i said that <laughs> Put, <hope>, holding pressure <laughs> i hope when my two-year-old son will come to watch you guys playing i hope he won't lose the joy of basketball yeah. After watching you play, hey, so hey, I hey, kind hey, of put hey, some nah, nah, pressure. Nah, nah, nah. They, got, they had a and we didn't even show Look, up, but you know these hey, man, guys. They, they, had they, they had a quality chip team on their shoulders, you know, to, to prove they had a quality team, and and the opposition in the final was also they got, these guys were good. So I I can I can tell you like I I've, I've seen plenty of amateur basketball in Lithuania. Like this was pretty high level uh, competition. So there will be uh, a, a vlog. Uh, on Lithuanian hour, oh, nice. YouTube I, I saw that you guys had uh, cameras all over you, like you were making a Netflix documentary or something. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, more or less like on the same all level. Or, all know? or nothing basket news. <laughs> Basketball quality and production-wise, more or less Netflix series type of level. So, I see, I see. Yeah, Donatas put uh, a lot of uh, pressure and my biggest fear was losing and then having to listen to his comments and messages throughout the week yeah. or even throughout the year, you know, saying that... Which is surprising because I'm, I'm actually the biggest supporter of our company i've never complained are, to people yeah but i know i know but but if we would have lost yeah. be honest i wouldn't care less to no, be honest. no 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 i'm so you honest. would have you I would wouldn't have care read, less you 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 would have i wouldn't care less sure. you can read the comments <laughs> from the previous year's competition where we didn't even make the second stage I think. you should be more involved in this like no, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's no, a big I don't, deal. to be honest. <laughs> he, just, he, just, <laughs> he just takes a photo with a trophy later, you know, I, in the office. I, uh, listen, okay, anyway, I, what I wanted to, to, to say in the beginning uh, is Jared Harper's uh, <laughs> appeal for, for free free throws and Alex Mumbrou's challenge the funniest thing that, that happened in the EuroLeague so far this season? To me, it was, I, I it was so. so funny. I, I couldn't stop laughing, honestly. We heard. <laughs> what happened there? We heard. You didn't see? No, you didn't, didn't see? see? Oh my God. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So, let, let me tell him. <laughs> let tell me tell him, him how you I saw him. from my yeah, sofa yeah, you, on the TV. You tell Did it happen in EuroLeague or ACB? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a Euroleague. Euroleague. Friday, Friday night. night. Friday night. EuroLeague game. Friday night. Valencia Bosconia. Okay. Okay. Friday okay. night. Whoop, whoop. Anyway, I'm, I'm watching this Valencia Bosconia game. Pretty interesting one, you know. Second half, Bosconia starting to turn around. Some some heated moments. Chima Moneke talking to the fans coaches and jared harper just tries to draw uh, a foul like 10 meters 11 meters near half court just just across the half court and uh just basically blocking foul and he just throws the ball huh. but the ball goes like two meters high into the stands not even towards the rim 
And uh, he says, I was shooting. He wanted a free throw. And Alex Mumbrou asked for a challenge. <laughs> and even before asking a challenge, Ritis and Jonas, our Lithuanian colleagues, started to laugh because, you know, he wanted these, these pretty ridiculous free throws. And when Alex Mumbrou just <laughs> c c calls a challenge, these two guys just lost it. They started laughing with the highest notes of laugh possible. Then, since I now commentate and I know when you turn off the mic, you can't hear, you just hear, they're laughing, laughing, laughing. Bam, Boss. bam, it's nothing for 20 seconds. Nobody's talking. It was hysterical. I mean, <laughs> they come back. <laughs> How do you challenge they, that? They come back, they come back, they come back to the broadcast and they're still laughing for <laughs> after 30 seconds or something. It was just straight two Man. minutes of laughing in everyone, if, in everybody's own. Just. I mean, the guy, he just threw the ball out of bounds. It's, it, I mean, it's one thing if, if he throws the ball somewhere closer to the rim, like he just threw the ball out of bounds after the contact, after, after the call. And, and it's, it's one thing that the player is asking for free free throws. So players yeah. usually do that. That's, that's the, their instinct. But <laughs> the challenge, I was, I, I, I was epic. The replay, uh, because we, we actually, will, maybe uh, that we was show actually you. we will show you after the, the, the free podcast. throws that he would have got like three or four years ago because they were sending guys on the free throw line. For I don't, I don't think there was an era where you could get free throws for shooting the ball. Uh, like the rim is here and you're shooting the ball over there. You're mm. throwing the ball over there. Who literally. made who literally. made the foul? Was it uh, Marcus Howard? I'm sure, probably Marcus Howard. I think so. Because they, they didn't have, have uh, 14 fouls yet, yeah. so it was a smart foul. Uh, so, uh, But the, the challenge, it was ridiculous. ridiculous. I, I mean, the refs are, are professionals, but I believe that... Uh, Look, I found it. You, you found it? <laughs> and he's looking. <laughs> he's... <laughs> wow. I was shooting. Yeah. And it's not like the end of the fourth quarter where you no, do everything. Uh, eight minutes. J just... In the third wow, quarter. Wow, that's that's really hilarious. I think the referees wow. were pr probably laughing inside. Wow, I really expected something, you know, more serious. No, no, I no. Mean, no, 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 no. If I was some... the referee, if I was the referee to go and okay, re review yeah. this, and I'm no, watching there, the replays, even four years ago, there was no chance. How, to how do you keep a straight nothing. face uh, reviewing okay, this play? I, I like, thought that he at least threw the ball, you know, toward the rim, and you know, the no, ball just went. He out threw of the ball to some no, of, no, so, okay, so, okay, so, no, some of the courtside seats. Uh, this one, the, is ball, funny. the ball goes to the si sideline out of bounds, yeah. not, even, not even baseline yeah. out of bounds. Okay. I mean, the, the, the challenge is, yeah. is so ridiculous. Like, we don't have a, a shacked in a fool in, in Europe. Would be on one, definitely. It, probably we have some funny former players that could actually take this thing and, and, and or we could and have make Nigel Hayes Davis. Like Nigel host, Hayes Davis sure. uh, making a collection of EuroLeague bloopers and this would be on, on top, honestly. Yeah. To me, the funniest moment of the season so far. So, Donatas Urbanas, Rytis Vishniauskas, Augustas Šuliauskas on, the, on their bonus podcast. And our first segment was the top three highlights of the last week because the, this week was crazy. But I see that we have at least two highlights on that top three already, right? I mean, Augustas uh, winning uh, all these trophies and, and th then... This was not Harper's. a EuroLeague, though. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, there are weeks where we um, watch yearly games and we're like, what are we going to talk about on Monday's podcast? Because you could do like hardcore analysis of the games mm. we have seen, but at the same time, there are no like funny stories or there are no like serious stories happening and just, you know, maybe some off the court stuff. And this week was like, okay, we have to just choose really carefully what mm. we want to say, because if not... We haven't been here for two weeks, so we could probably sit here for three hours and just talk about what we saw in every game. And, you know, play of the year by Madrid on Tuesday, that, that uh, blind pig action mm. and the uh, alley-oop between Campazzo and Poirier. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not EuroLeague, but Yamadar getting hit in the eye, and now he's saying, you know, that he might be seeing worse than he was before, and they're doing, you know, just checks. That's a, another big story as well, and we are not getting even into the games. You know, Partizan winning a crazy game, Fenerbahce winning a crazy game, uh, Basconia coming back against Valencia. So there's so much stuff to talk about in this week. Okay, so what was your top top highlight? My top top highlight, I would say that uh, it was a really hard pick between Campazzo, perform Campazzo's performance and Partizan, and I would say that probably. 
partisan, their game, and just my overall view um, is that partisan season starts really now. It 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 didn't start in you know first days of October. It starts now because they finally have their main player back. You know after the injury, Kevin Punter is back, and he struggled for the first thirty minutes for the first three quarters, but had a huge huge fourth quarter and and an overtime. And they have Bruno Caboclo, which is who is having a crazy early impact. Uh, his uh, advanced stats are really great. You know, he's with him on the court. Partizan are scoring. Partizan's second best offense is even better with him by 12 points per 100 possessions. Like they would be easily number one offensive team with him. Defensively, he's improving a lot. It's super small sample size, but uh, like his impact defensively and the things he does on the court is just great. And I think that not only his individual abilities help a lot, but he also helps other people look much better on defense. So I think partisan season uh, starts now. Last year, they were four and nine before they got uh, some players after the injuries. This year, they were four and six, and they won this first game with Kabakla and Punter. And I really think that now uh, they are actually starting their real season and they should be, you know, uh, trending uh, upwards in the next couple of months. So this was probably my number one takeaway for, from this week. I would actually, I would say that it, they're not even starting the season now because they might add another guard. They still need time for Kevin Punter to return to his rhythm. It will take some mm. time. So I would say that in the few weeks, they will start the season, let's say now, like they did last year with Alexa Vramovic yeah. joining the team and also changing the momentum of the season. I also have one of my top three highlights from this particular game. And actually it comes from the uh, opposing team. Panathinaikos, I barely remember anybody taking away Kevin Punter's pull-up jumper basically hmm. at the buzzer to win the game for Partizan in a way Jerry and Grant did. Just was, completely shutting amazing. down KP in that situation. You know, when he was in his motion with his signature move, he just stole the ball in a situation where it's really hard to stop uh, Kevin Punter. And, you know, it just... For one more time, and illustrated the defensive impact that Jerry and Grant is is having in Panathinaikos in, in this uh, Euroleague season. Uh, um, there are also some crazy advanced stats. Uh, first of all, Panathinaikos is uh, the number two team in the Euroleague per defensive rating, according to Bbolitics. And when Grant is on the court, Pau concedes 14 fewer points compared when he's on the bench. His overall net rating is 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 crazy, 28. With him on the court per mm -hmm. 100 possessions, Pau outscores their opponents by 28 points. Uh, and w what's funny that nobody predicted Jaren Grant having such an important role in Panathinaikos before the season. Uh, and Grant is second in total minutes played for Panathinaikos. They brought Slukas, they brought Vildoza, they brought Juancho Hernan Gomez, they brought Matias Lasort. And what's funny that nobody uh, could 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 see Mitoglu Grigones and Jaren Grant playing the highest number of minutes in, in Pachnaiko's team. And yeah, Jaren Grant is just one of those uh, brightest names, uh, brightest faces of this year's uh, Pachnaiko's team. And once again, he proved his value against Partizan. He was the reason why Punter was scoreless in the first three quarters. And then, of course, KP did KP stuff. Uh, it was hard to, to contain him. He's one of the best uh, scorers in the EuroLeague, so it's impossible to keep him uh, scoreless for the entire uh, game. But Jaren Grand, once again, did a tremendous job defensively. He, he was actually risking there a lot, you know, like just slapping the wall like this away. In the last seconds, you could easily get... Yeah. You could easily touch, you know, Punter's arm and, and that's that that would be a foul and free throws for Partizan in the last moments, but he was you know, he risked it and uh he got that steal away and Grigonis was I I think zero point five seconds away from winning it. But he actually I think did one dribble mm -hmm. too much there in the end. But that would that was really uh, a nice game to watch, a lot of uh, drama and big shots, defensive plays, PJ Dozier. Exactly. They, Lazor getting this warm applause before the game. This yeah. gift. It was megaphone. How how do you call it? I think so. Yeah, yeah. That he used to to take into his hands uh, and to celebrate with fans. What was the top highlight for you, Edith? Top highlight: Rocket Team. 
man. When Monaco and Olympiacos you know, meet, team, meet, Mike James. Uh, <laughs> there's always something something special happening. You know, these two teams have a story, and that game was was really tight. Uh, that was a good game uh, with a lot of emotions, uh, with Demo being ejected because of a technical foul, and uh, no, he got an unsportsmanlike yeah. foul first, and then a Lithuanian referee calls a technical foul for a Lithuanian player. Was it, was player. it Trukis, Actually, I, so. I think I, that I, there was this um, I baseline, so. or, or referee. maybe he just talked to him because, probably because he's probably. a Lithuanian. But anyway, so after that moment, uh, the crowd got even more involved in, into the game. We know that maybe Monaco doesn't have. Uh, passionate fans as Olympia Kos and many others but the atmosphere in, in that little gym was was really nice and uh, the game was tied as I said and, and actually Mike James took over in, in the fourth quarter in the last minutes uh, Olympia Kos Throughout the game, they were making shots. Uh, they had some really good runs, especially with Isaiah Cannon uh, scoring, but in the fourth quarter when it mattered the most, they just couldn't get to the rim. They couldn't finish. Uh, in general, they made some important shots like Thomas Walker responding with a spot up, spot up free when Monaco is, is trying to, to break the game. But uh, in the last minutes, I think uh, Monaco had better leadership. Olympiacos didn't have that and, and Monaco won the game. So to me, this is the highlight. Uh, I was really looking forward to this game because like mm. Monaco and Olympiacos is sort of a rivalry right now. Mm. It's not a rivalry in the sense that uh, the fans are clashing and, and, mm. and they want to prove something uh, and it, it, it's not a derby or anything like that, but just because of the quarterfinal series. It's a healthy the, rivalry. The, yeah, healthy semifinal. basketball rivalry, just, yeah. just a, a healthy competition, like the semifinal uh, in Konas, uh, mm. that third quarter, like I said, and that quarterfinal series, best of five, yeah. uh, when Monaco made it to the playoffs for the first time. So now we, when they play each other, even in a regular season, um, you can always expect something. My, my highlights of that oh, game sorry. was when you know Monaco won the game. Players are shaking hands with each other, and there was this moment when Mike James Bartzokas was coming toward the locker room. Mike, Mike James just tapped Bartzokas. He turned back, and you know they just hugged. And there was big meaning behind this hug because it's ver it was very likely that Mike James was about to join Olympiacos at the start of the season. Hmm. But was it a, another scenario where simply? You know, if Olympia Cause go to um, equal fourth quarter and, you know, the last five minutes is where usually, you know, individual abilities take over in, in the games where, you know, teams switch, teams play really aggressive defense, it's really, really hard to score because there are not, not a lot of fast breaks. Was it, was it another game of where just, you know, individual abilities in the clutch decided the game basically? I, I would say so. I would say so because Mike was doing his thing. Like when he got into the zone, he made the shots, but he was also trusting his teammates. As usual, when mm. he needs to pass the ball, he passes the ball. There was this really nice possession where they found Dante Hall under the rim. Uh, not very often you see, like in the fourth quarter, in the crunch time, that a team shares the ball so much that basically your center uh, is able to finish with a dunk or a mm. layup. Uh, so usually you take some perimeter shots. There's more ISO basketball, as you said. Uh, you're just trusting your best players. And, you know, when Jordan Lloyd is not playing, you have this question. Um, are they going to close the game? Are they going to play the fourth quarter uh, the way they should? Because Jordan Lloyd is, is so important for them. So in this game, maybe not in the fourth quarter, but in general in the game, Elio Kobo was pretty solid. I think mm. this season he he's having a lot of ups and downs and probably more downs. Uh, mm. it, it, it hasn't been the best start of the season for him, actually. So when Jordan Lloyd is not playing, it's obvious that he's the second option. Um, Campbell Walker played 11 minutes, but again, I, I don't really believe he has it in him right now to influence games. He just, he's just covering minutes. And I mean, he scored four points, but uh other than that you, you cannot expect more from him so so yeah i i agree with you i agree that it just comes to to this like who's gonna have more quality uh in in the decisive moments and in this case it was monaco it's nice to have you know <laughs> it's nice to have mike or an ellie in your team just just by being on the court by having the ball mike creates advantages for other players because of the way teams try to defend him so yeah Anyway, my second takeaway from, from this week was, yeah, I mean, 
we cannot not mention Real Madrid, Fenerbahce's game. And what a great win by Fenerbahce. I mean, coming back from, from that deficit in the fourth quarter. But for me, the highlight is Campazzo hero to zero moment. You know, he was about to pull off, I don't know, a legendary performance, even though he missed a lot of threes. But 47 points uh, created, you know, points plus assist by Facundo Campazzo in this game. Fenner tried to go under with him, but he was manipulating those screens so well. And, you know, Itudis wanted Nigel Hayes Davis to guard him, a bigger guy, so he can navigate through screens and maybe, you know, uh, contest his three point attempts, make it a little bit harder for him to shoot those floaters, layups. But he was just so masterful at navigating those screens. He got open floaters in, in every possession, basically, he wanted against a really hard drop defense. So, so many floaters he made, so many tough layups, so many... They were pushing him to his left. Yeah. And he just finished casually with his left hand. And and they were allowing him to shoot those from, from two meters. And, yeah. and he did not miss single one of those, 11 from 11. Um, he did miss a lot of frees because Fenerbahce we were really good at denying others uh, from the ball. And in the fourth quarter, Itudis said, enough of these layups, you know, I'm, I'm sick of those. They started switching. And that's where, you know, basically they turned the game upside down. Uh, no, e no more easy shots, no more easy advantages. And, you know, they were still so close from winning this game, from keeping their record undefeated. And then in basically one moment, he made four things that you don't usually say, you know, what, what to not do in the clutch. He made all of those. Like, he caught the ball really close to the, to the sideline. He catched it and dribbled immediately, although it was like six seconds left. So you can hold the ball for five seconds and they will for sure make a foul because they're losing. Uh, then he dribbled and ca caught it immediately. That's another mistake. And then he jumped to pass because obviously there were two guys much taller than him. And he could have thrown, tried to throw, throw, throw the ball to the legs. He didn't do that as well. And... All of a sudden, from a legendary performance, your mistake cost the game for Real Madrid and the first loss of that season. So I just, uh, for me, it showed how hard it is, even for experienced players, to uh, you know deliver in the clutch because some some just some of these episodes are really uh, difficult, and then yeah. he was put into really a diff difficult situation. <clears throat> in, there, the, so. in the heat of the moment, even the best players sometimes make mistakes, and that's that's normal. Uh, and it was just a matter of time when Real Madrid will get this first loss. Uh, but it, they didn't lose in the manner which I imagined. Like, they were leading in this game. They were sort of in control. And in the end, all they needed to do was just take care of the ball and they will foul you, make your free throws, and you're probably winning this game. I mean, even if he, he throws the ball somehow to the other side of the court, time is running, the clock is yeah. ticking. But the pass was just... The terrible angle, like uh, Gabi Deck wasn't even near the ball mm -hmm. when Fenerbahce players That was a Hail Mary, stole the ball. Mary pass. Absolutely, but Hail Mary passes usually are Long uh, longer. And high. <laughs> Long and high, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, my takeaway still uh, and my second highlight is, is not the fact that Fenerbahce won or Madrid lost, but uh, Faku uh, being a guard. And finishing with 11 from 11 um, two pointers, mm. that that reminds me of I don't know peak Tony Parker, <laughs> when, when when TP was leading the NBA by points in the paint by the percentage from the paint being a guard, uh, he had this nice teardrop shot and, and and he basically was scoring from from the paint, so for a guard and you could say even a, a bit undersized guard to have those numbers against a very physical team is something spectacular, honestly. Um, the, yes, they lost the game, but but still, I was so amazed uh, with, with Facundo Campasso. And they had a double week, obviously, because mm. they had to play Maccabi okay. That was a blowout game. Actually, in the first quarter, the way Maccabi was, was, was defending the pick and roll, I thought that uh, Eddie Tavares is going to finish with Will Chamberlain's numbers, and he's going to he's going to hold that 100 sign. <laughs> uh, but yeah, <laughs> uh, that play also happened, as, mm -hmm. as you said, with with Vincent Poirier. And the the bad thing is that uh, 
it's becoming to me honestly i mean it's a bit off topic i'm gonna be very short uh it's so hard to commentate Maccabi's games in that empty gym mm. so hard to get into that game like uh, it, it reminds me of the COVID season and these are not good memories mm. and at least I mean I know they are playing in Belgrade but I would love to see some fans there at least spectators neutrals some sort of atmosphere because it's 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 really tough to to watch that, that play of the year I, I wrote to Donatas this yeah. message it, it's such a it's not a shame. It's an un- unfortunate that the play of the year mm. happened with no crowd. Happened with no crowd. Yeah, and that was just uh, the the play was absolutely spectacular, amazing, beautiful. They should have edited that video somehow. Add some noise. <laughs> Add some <laughs> background noise. Cheering for I'll, that. At, at that time, I was actually uh, commentating the game, and I was talking about uh, the the young fellow. I don't remember his last name. The number nine from Madrid. He was making his Euroleague debut, so I'm kind of reading his his Wikipedia or something, and and that play happens, and I'm just saying, oh, there's a lot to Poirier with no emotion <laughs> at all, no emotion at all. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it's it's funny you mentioned Campazzo, 47 points created, right? In that game, points uh, plus assists. I I just have numbers from November, and I see that Campazzo actually led November in points and assists, and points created through points and assists. So he he led the Euroleague with 34.7 yep. points per game created, and the second best com, uh, comes Shane Larkin with 31 and point f- three. And I mean, it's still like 15 points fewer than what Campasso created in Istanbul. In so game. that's spectacular, man. And I, th- that's that's the funny part because you know this game in Istanbul was crazy, and I think that Fenerbahce they completely deserved that uh, comeback. They were you know uh, they were always trying to stay close. They were they didn't surrender. They were fighting. But even when after the game, I texted one of Fenerbahce players and I congratulated him with this amazing comeback. And his first first very first response was, "They're so good." I mean, I know we won, but they are amazing. So this kind of reaction also tells uh, a lot about how great Real Madrid uh, is r- right now at, at the start of the EuroLeague season. We should stop calling it start because like, it's round 11. Okay. okay. <laughs> Maybe we should get used <laughs> to it. We're getting closer to the middle, actually. Okay. It's like <laughs> one third of the season done, yeah. actually. One of, okay. Exactly. That's a, yeah, that's a good reminder. One first part of the, first season. Part of the season. Let's say first part of the season. This this First. November it like went like a flash. Yep. I yeah. don't know how about you guys, but I just remember That's that we true. were doing October uh, review like a week ago. <laughs> I have the same feeling. So yeah, that was a weird month. Uh, what and do you have as your highlight? so? I had my this Fenerbahce conversation. Uh, this conversation with Fenerbahce player as my highlight that describes Real Madrid's greatness, and also my third highlight. I would actually call it a low light. Okay, it's not from the Euro League, but the thing which happened with Yamadar in, mm. in in a game against Besiktas. What's interesting that we were actually planning to potentially attend this game because we were planning a trip to Istanbul. That didn't happen, but this game was in our plans. And you know, uh, I was surprised that there were so many Besiktas fans. I didn't know that they they played in Sinan Erdem Arena, and it was like fifteen thousand Besiktas fans in that game. So you know, and we all know this Besiktas Fenerbahce Galatasaray rivalry. So. Uh, for sure, it was a great experience, but man, to have such things, such events happening, and to me, it's it's crazy that in 2023, when the player is hit by an object, which almost, you know, he almost lost, partially lost his vision with, with that eye that he was hit, and we still played the game with the fans, I mean, for me, it's it's really surprising. I mean, what else should happen to say to send a clear message to the fans that a in in these kind of circumstances we cannot continue the game. So please uh, leave the gym and we'll finish the game without the fans. And you know, I saw Besiktas uh, official uh, press release and they. Uh, blamed one of Fenerbahce executives for provoking fans because I don't know the whole story. I just saw the clip where he was, you know, on the um, courtside seats complaining, you know, standing and going somewhere, complaining about something, whether it was a refereeing or, or, or whatever. But come on, 
it, there shouldn't be any excuse for throwing things at players, at teams, you know, hitting them, hurting them, and, and, and still continuing the game. And focusing on that Fenerbahce executive on your press release when, when the player was, was hurt really bad. So to me, this was the low light that I wanted to address uh, from the last week. And you have talked about it so many times exactly. on this yeah. podcast. So. It's just, I don't understand why people have to release anger by throwing things at other people, you know, in a basketball game, which is entertainment, type of entertainment, this is not, yes, there are rivalries between clubs, but there is just, there shouldn't be a, a place where you throwing things at another person who is playing a game for a team you do not, do not support, and it is okay, you know, by, by many uh, other supporters that's 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 just sad to me and we have talked about this so many times on this podcast so we're not probably going to yeah. repeat i'm, ju I'm just actually too I'm much not, time on this yeah. but i'm not surprised by people being irrational and especially in sports events i'm just surprised that we're not taking any serious actions you know toward trying to control that trying to prevent uh, mm. protect uh, players so that's what bothers me the most oh and i i remember now what i wanted to say also every time this happens in a domestic leagues like in your league, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. The, the ratio of these things happening on your league and on domestic levels is like what, ninety percent to ten percent, ninety-five to five. When was the when was the last time you know, similar thing happened in the Euro League? You know, you you talk about playoffs uh, in the Euro League. Let's say um, Mo Monaco Maccabi last year, mm. when they were I don't know what happened there when they were going to the tunnel. It were just just words or or spitting or 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 what? There was spitting, I think. But other than that, mm. no. But you know, on domestic level, you hear just so so many stories. Every derby game this. has something. Derby know, so. finals, whatever. It's just you know, fix your security in domestic leagues. I don't mm. know. Whatever. Do we have? Maybe maybe people on weekends tend to <laughs> get crazy. They want this, the security also will watch the game. <laughs> Uh, Do we have any other highlights? Yeah, but let's go back to the highlights. Uh, Positive highlights. Yeah, exactly. So Olympia Milano, right? <sighs> or Jalgiris Komnes, you mean? Or we're again coming back to lowlights. We're coming back to the lowlights. Nah, man, I'm going to focus on, on positive. <laughs> <laughs> Serge Ibaka, the shot blocker. Ooh. He deserves a shout out for sure. Uh, his best game of the season, and Bayern Munich actually beat a really solid uh, Virtus Bologna team. Ibaka finishing with these numbers in 23 minutes, he had 24 points, uh, 10 from 13 shooting, uh, free from free free throws, 13 rebounds, six of those are offensive rebounds, uh, two blocks, two block shots, and, and 34 in PIR. He still has it. Yep. He still has it. Uh, and and th this month, he also had a solid performance versus Jalgiris uh, yeah. away from home. They just didn't win the game. They lost it by by one single shot uh, mm -hmm. from Keenan Evans. Um, and, and I know he's not going to play 30 minutes or 35 minutes, but in the 20 minutes that he plays, he has such a huge impact on the court. I mean, I'm amazed. I didn't really expect that. I thought, okay, from all the NBA big name signings that that were made in Europe, probably it's the better one. But mm -hmm. I didn't expect him to be so good. Uh, it's so nice to see it, and I definitely wanted to mention him. We're probably not going to analyze the Bayern Munich mm -hmm. versus Bologna game in in yeah. depth, but Sergi Baca, it's. It's so nice to see him performing at a very high level. I was about to give, give him a shout out in the end when we mm, uh, ranked our team. team of November. Yeah, he is my center there. So, mm. man, and he's huge. I mean, it's we, been a while since I saw him. him. <laughs> I saw him, you know, live in yeah. in, in front of my, my eyes. But he, he's damn huge. But what <laughs> impresses me the most is is how smart he is, how uh, calm he is all the time. I I imagine he he's a perfect teammate even f especially for the younger players and you can always trust him to make the right play to read the game he reads the game so well he mm -hmm. knows when he needs to shoot he knows where when he needs to attack he knows when he needs to pass and defensively uh, whatever task Pablo Lasso wants him to do he's going to do it so um it's just great to see these legendary players 
still performing, still balling. Uh, we have Bellinelli playing an amazing season. We have uh, some other veteran players like the Teodosic or the Colo, but Ibaka, we haven't seen him in Europe for a long, long time. And what was your last third highlight? Or ah, uh, let's go with a different topic. Okay. Uh, and the no, different no light, low lights, right? So yeah. And the different topic is the Olympic qualifying tournaments. Uh, we have four hosts uh, for the pre-Olympic for the Olympic uh, qualifiers. Uh, and actually, the funny story, you know, and I will quite, okay, uh, the, the whole story is that, uh, so Latvia, Spain, Puerto Rico, and Greece, they will host uh, the Olympic qualifiers. Uh, and there was not actually a big competition for hosting rights, because one of the main arguments uh, was that, if you remember well, three years ago, before Tokyo, all four ho hosts didn't manage to make the Olympics. And the thing is that hosting rights of Olympic qualifiers cost almost 3 million euro. So you pay almost 3 million euro for a six day event. And as most of the basketball federations, you know, fought and if it doesn't even help to make the Olympics. So what's what's the sense of, of make, paying so much money? Uh, so the competition wasn't very serious for the hosting rights, but we have Valencia, Riga, Pireus and San Juan uh, taking uh, over. And my question, uh, followed by the host's failure in the last uh, qualifiers, would be, what would be your dark horse for each group to mm. win the qualifiers? So we will go group by group. Uh, just a reminder that only one team, the top team of the qualifying tournament in, in one country will advance to the Olympics. So in Valencia for the single ticket, Spain as hosts, Finland, Poland, Bahamas, Lebanon and Angola will be fighting for that qualification. I think we should also mention that there's a group stage, first of all. So Spain oh, is, yeah. is in group A with Angola and Lebanon. Okay. Group B is Finland, Poland and Bahamas. And group B is, is, mm. is, is tough, like Spain will win the group, it's obvious. But from the other group, we have two pretty solid European teams. We have Finland with a star player, Laurie, Laurie Markkinen and, and Bahamas. Well, they already had three or four solid NBA players and they're using this sort of FIBA loophole exception to make even uh, players that actually participated in tournaments for Team USA now uh, to play for them, uh, so who they, knows who they have Eric Gordon, have they, they have summer. DeAndre Ayton. There are rumors about Clay Thompson. I don't know what roster they will have, but it's pretty easy to Buddy say. Buddy Healed. Buddy Healed. Yeah, exactly. One of the best shooters uh, in the league right now. So it's easy to say that Bahamas is a dark horse. But if they have a roster in, in the end, if they have a roster with six or seven NBA players, are they even a dark horse? Yeah, they they probably favorites. become the favorites. Mm -hmm. um, so. I mean, if Spain... Nah, come on. Spain is the, Spain is yeah, the favorite here. If Spain has Lorenzo Brown, I'm probably trusting them to win it. But to call one team that could, could uh, cause an upset, I, I would say Bahamas. Mm. Yeah. I think in every uh, city, the favorite is the, uh, the, the host nation, except for Puerto Rico. Yeah. Where, you know, this, this was a funny situation because... Mm -hmm. I was read, you know, Litu we are in Lithuania, we are Lithuanian, so you you hear all the public opinion after the draw. But I I also follow a lot of Italian blogs, uh, basketball people and stuff. And what I saw in that evening on my timeline was both countries being super happy about <laughs> the qualifying draw. Well, it makes sense. It makes sense, of course, because all the four other te four teams on paper are way, um, let's say, way less competitive. And neither Lithuania nor Italy are the top, top shelf teams. So both were pretty happy because yeah. you basically need to beat, Lithuania needs to beat Italy and Italy needs to beat Lithuania. Although I wouldn't rule out Puerto, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is at home. They, they, so. And they have talent. And at least in the perimeter, if, if they have a team with Alvarado, with, mm. with Marcus Howard, with uh, Waters, um, well, they have talent and it's only one game. Mm -hmm. If they start making freeze like crazy, they're at home, yeah. who knows what's going to happen. Uh, but let's let's stick still to the to the first first uh, tournament in Valencia. Oh, okay. What do you guys have 
uh, as a possible upset. Do you agree on Bahamas? Yeah, I agree on Bahamas because that's why I went to the other group and, and yeah. that. I, sorry, sorry about that. I, nah, that's cool. It's cool. Just just to mention, I'm hearing that Poland might have interesting reinforcement for this tournament, oh, so I'm just we... <laughs> better watch out for them. Although nothing spectacular when can, you have you... Bahamas in your uh, group, but it, still. By reinforcement, you mean an American? Yeah. Kind of makes sense, right? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, all of a sudden, well, we... Jeremy Sohan hasn't played yet. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's also reinforcements. So if he joins, if they add an American uh, player, I uh, forgot about Sohan. Yeah, they have some nice players in Europe. They like, might like actually Bonitka, become, you know, a dark horse yeah. of this group. But Finland with with Markin and uh, they are also capable of beating any team in one game. We're talking about just just like one single game. Just Sasu Salin. But it, it's eight, it's tough for pointers. them because from Group B it will be hard to mm -hmm. even take one of the first two spots. Somebody will be out after the group stage. But yeah, watch out for for Poland. Can we have a name? I know. In, on this podcast, in Riga, in Riga, come on, man, no. we will have you can't, you can't just Latvia and in Group A as the hosts, Philippines and Georgia, Group A, and for Group B we have Brazil, Cameroon, and Montenegro. Augustus, I'm not participating <laughs> in doing this, man. <laughs> Who the hell cares about Latvia and Brazil now that you mentioned some Poland guy, some Poland, Poland bringing guy. in NBA player uh, there? <sighs> yeah, so Brazil looks promising with Iago, right? And Bruno Caboclo yeah, yeah, dominating Bruno in the Caboclo, Euroleague. Yeah, Bruno Caboclo, Iago you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Latvia are the favorites because they're playing at home, in my eyes. And, okay. you know, Luka Banki with that roster, Christoph Porzingis joining. He's mm -hmm. having the best season of his life, I think, in Boston. But, you know, I'm thinking that Porzingis has a deep playoff run. The NBA Finals go to Game 7. Uh. And... And what he does not play then? What does he it's have? Too like, early. He 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 has to celebrate the championship in Boston, and the next day he flies to Riga to already play. Like, that's it, not it's, that's it's, not ideal. It, I would it's agree. It's hard <laughs> to expect Porzingis to be in a good shape to perform uh, if we are expecting Boston to have a mm, deep playoff run. Deep, deep playoff run and maybe win the Eastern Conference. So. Uh, I don't know about Porzingis. I mean, he's an injury-prone player. Maybe the 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 low that he, he he takes in the NBA might cause him an injury or mm. something. It's it's hard to predict the future. And also, they will probably be without Dragers, one of the most important players uh, from from the FIBA World Cup, because he's right. still recovering after his ACL injury. And well, the timeline is tough to 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 see him back uh, in July without any any playing. Uh, in, in the, the same, season, yeah. like, but do you see any other potential dark I think, horses I think other these, than Brazil? These teams are pretty close, honestly. Mm -hmm. Montenegro, they have a core of six good players. players. They are led by Kendrick Perry as their point guard, and they have these big guys: uh, Vucevic, Dublovic, Simonovic, uh, and other players are role players, but they are experienced guys. So uh, they're a good team as well. Brazil and Georgia. I mean, Georgia, come on. Toko Shingeli is playing an MVP season right mm. now in, in EuroLeague. You have Mamukelashvili. You have Bitadze, Bitadze who is really good for Orlando. Orlando. He's really good yeah, for Orlando. Yeah. When Wendell Carter got injured, Bitadze got his spot, and, and he's playing solid basketball right now. Um, they will also have an American guard. They had McFadden in but the McFadden past. But McFadden is, is playing low minutes. So maybe they will and add somebody else. what if they will naturalize another Yeah, because they always American had player. somebody. Yeah. So See, you have MVP I remember in the past they had... Bitaize and this American player. Yeah. I go with Georgia, to be honest, as my dark horse in this group. Uh, and I, I'm not really sure about the dark horse. To me, these teams seem really close. Mm. I'm not, I, I, yeah, don't, yeah. I don't see Latvia as yeah. huge favorites. They are favorites in the sense they're playing at home, and if Porzingis is there, they will have the best player of the tournament. But mm, it's, it's so close to me, and I'm calling maybe Montenegro to be the team that will surprise mm. m many people. You see, but this is where I think this this discussion is not fair because uh, Donatas mentioned two of his dark horses, Poland and Georgia, and both might add a, uh, an um, American and he, player. He, and, and he, he knows, knows something we don't. We don't know. And that's national like, team basketball <laughs> runs nowadays. Yeah. No, but Georgia, yeah, I, players I from the Look, agency. Agency. It's but easy to expect this from Georgia because in the past they always had a player. Like they had Jacob Pullen, they had Dixon, I believe. Mm. Uh, Bobby Dixon. After, no. Not, not Bobby Dixon, that guy who played Mike in Lithuania. Cole. 
But I remember what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, he was great. Dan McFadden, <laughs> McFadden. So they will probably have somebody. And Montenegro has Kendrick Perry. Mm. So. And I love his performance on your show, by the way. He's good. He's really good. He was solid. Uh, so, so what, what, what are you picking? Pick? What are you picking? I'm going with Brazil, if they can ah. be called a dark horse. Okay. Mm. Let's say yeah. every non-host team could be okay. eligible yeah. for, for mm -hmm. a dark host title in this case. So Lithuania is a dark horse? Or Italy? No. Like no, the team it with... doesn't make sense then. Team with... Yeah. with Puerto Rico, with Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico ruins is everything. Yeah. Puerto Rico is a different uh, story because okay, they're yeah, not okay. the favorites as a host nation. Uh, so before Puerto Rico, we have uh, these qualifiers in Piraeus. Group A with Slovenia, New Zealand and Croatia. Group B, Egypt, Greece and Dominican Republic. If these teams assemble all the main guys, this is the tournament I I want to go, I want to watch. It might be better than the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> not really. Uh, but, but, I mean, Giannis with Greece. I'm saying might be, not not that it will be. But to have these stars in one qualif qualifying tournament is, yep. is a huge loss for the Olympics, to mm. be honest. Well, people are probably expecting Yanis uh, Luka final for for the uh, for the mm -hmm. ticket to Paris. But there will be Carl but Anthony Towns and Andre Feliz and 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 those guys. And Croatia. And Croatia. But you know, we tend to always I don't trust Croatia talk, anymore. Talk no, nobody does. Nobody does, but but I, somewhere deep inside nah. you, you always have this Thought that I had this feeling before the maybe. Eurobasket, if you remember, but after that, now I'm done with Croatia. Mm. It, was, it was their last chance. The trust I cannot trust them broken. anymore. <laughs> nah. Honestly, I, my honest opinion is that teams that didn't even qualify for the World Cup shouldn't even be here. Like The system is, 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 is mm -hmm. strange, to say the least. But they are here. They, they, they fought for the spot in the pre-qualifying tournament for the qualifying tournament. Thanks, FIBA. Uh, <laughs> I do see them like a dangerous team. New Zealand probably doesn't have enough a, have a chance against... Uh, I mean, uh, maybe if Steven Adams was healthy, you, you, you could see Steven Adams playing for the national team and it changes uh, the picture. But now you know that he's injured, mm -hmm. so he's not going to play. Mm. I'm still taking Slovenia and Greece to, to, to be the two teams facing each other yeah. in the final. And if we're talking about upsets, well, the hosts are yeah. the favorites, then I have to say Slovenia is the dark horse. But uh, I mean, in any context, Luka Doncic's team calling them the, a, a dark horse sounds, <laughs> sounds really <laughs> stupid. Really stupid. But Greece will definitely be different than they were if they uh, have in, Giannis. in the Philippines. If, they if have Giannis, Giannis is not playing... Who's well, with, with Giannis, you kind of have the same question I had with Porzingis. Like, mm -hmm. if Milwaukee goes deep into the playoffs, mm -hmm. they win the Eastern Conference, they play the NBA Finals, the it's a tough situation. Game 7 of the NBA Finals is scheduled to be played on June 23rd. Uh, and the qualifying tournaments will start on Second 2nd of July. So we have almost I a mean, week between. I it, mean, it's, it's manageable, but can you... Imagine yourself being a player that just plays his heart out in the NBA Finals and he wins the championship and then, what, two or three days later, he, he has to suit up for the national team? I mean, There's since Giannis little break. is really proud of being a member of Greek national team, I see that happening, to be honest. Because I, it's I see that happening, but it's so, so hard to perform physically and, and mentally on your That's highest true. level after this. Like, when you win the NBA Championship, the Larry O'Brien. It seems like it's done. That's it. Now yeah, I now I, I can I, relax. You want, you want life, <laughs> but man, Yanis is twenty eight. You know, if if Greece will miss this one, the Olympics in Paris, who knows? I know. If he will I get know. another shot. I'm actually not betting on Milwaukee to win the East. I'm I'm going with Boston, but it's a long shot. Uh, there's still a, a lot of time. It's still not even midway in the uh, the regular season. So even, wow. even Luka Doncic theoretically could go, could go yeah. and win the Western Conference with Dallas, although I don't believe in it, but it's mm. possible. So just our conclusion from this is that NBA playoffs are going to do, have a lot with this. Mm -hmm. Could potentially yeah. uh, impact the way Olympic qualifiers go. It's true. Go. It's true. Uh, probably the only difference is that if Luka is not playing... We don't consider Slovenia. We're not even talking about no. Slovenia. But if Giannis is not playing, do we think that I Slovenia still, is the favorites? Or uh, we go with Greece? 
I'm I would not say, sure. I would say it's. The Slovenia will have Luca. I still uh, have this Chancha bad image about Greece from, 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 from Manila. Going to naturalize? I still really have this bad image uh, from Manila. Like, I, mm. I know that even without Yanis, they could be better. But you know, they could have uh, Slukas, Mitoglu, yes. um, Walkup, Dorsey. They, potentially. They, potentially, yeah. they could be a much Spanulis better team. is the new head coach, so it's not like, you know, there, was, uh, there are some personal things. So maybe, but man, Slovenia will be great. Vladko Chancher, again, we're not sure who they're going to naturalize. Another dark horse, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in that sense. So I'm not sure. If Yanis is not playing, I'm not sure. I might go with Slovenia as the favorite to win the... True, but I would ours. say Greece still have a chance, even if Yanis yeah, is not yeah. playing. Yeah, yeah. Completely mm -hmm. different conversation. Yep. And all of a sudden, Carl Anthony Townsend, Al Horford, <laughs> take over <laughs> Greece. Yeah. That's if you remember the... 2021 experience, you know, that wouldn't be surprise, uh, surprising, having these memories with Czech Republic qualifying uh, oh, yeah. to the Olympics. And so the last group that we have in San Juan... We, uh, we kind of discussed it already. So Puerto Rico is our, yeah. uh, our dark horses. Puerto Rico plays with Italy and Bahrain, and in Group A we have Mexico, Ivory Coast, and Lithuania. Come on, if Lithuania and Italy are not in the final here... They are the heavy favorites. There's this one dark horse in here, and it's the the host, Puerto Rico. They could have a big night, you know, with uh, with their guys. I don't know, someone stepping up and just, you know, having two nights of their lives. Tremont Waters, maybe, you know. So they will have Alvarado probably. They, he didn't play in the. World they will Cup, be solid. So they might at be least solid. in the perimeter. So. Marcus Howard also got Puerto Rico passport, right? Uh, I don't think there there is such a thing like Puerto Rico passport. Oh yeah, uh, like there is <laughs> just no, thing like he is eligible to play for Puerto Rico. You're, you're becoming say, eligible. Yeah. There are some rules, but in general, like almost any American yeah, can yeah. basically That's right. become a Puerto Rican. I'm just not sure how it goes with FIBA rules. With yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know honestly. I'm just thinking like it's a. Unofficial fifty first state is a, it's a, it's a U.S. territory, so mm. it's it's probably different than obtaining, uh, let's say, Italian yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, passport and playing for Italy. So, uh, but uh, I, I agree that you can treat them as a, as, as a dark horse. Mm. Like they have there's only one for there's an only one game, and and you're at home. You play Italy. If, if in you your start first well, you start then... making shots. You go on yeah. a run. The crowd gets into it, and Puerto Rico is, is a pretty passionate team. From even what we saw in the Italy. World Cup, they go on mm -hmm. on runs. They then they uh, get the run for, for, from the other team. Like I remember their game with South Sudan. It was a crazy basketball game. Yeah. Uh, so if if they draw you into this chaos, mm -hmm. you 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 can have problems. So uh, I think that Lithuania must win this. I'm not saying they should or or or. I expect them to. Uh, they must. Hmm. But Italy is, is well. They might be an uncomfortable opponent sometimes. You know that they're always uncomfortable <laughs> opponent. Somehow they they make themselves uncomfortable all the time. Uh, anyways, uh, I will take you through. I would call it rumor mill. Uh, we had we had some stories from the last week. We have some stories for this week. But I will start from from Mr. Dwight Howard. Last week, I reported a story that Dwight Howard is seriously considering career continuation in Europe or Australia, preferably. Uh, he wants to play there at a serious level in order to get the last chance to sign an NBA contract and to prove his value. Uh, and uh, he's, opened, he's open to EuroLeague or EuroCup, or probably BCL teams. From my side, what I heard, he... He, w he was willing to play for Venice because Venice's head coach, Nevin Spahia, uh, they worked together in Atlanta a few years ago. Spahia was the assistant coach of the Hawks and uh, Howard spent there one season. So he was willing to play there, but Venice wants somebody... Since Howard wants the NBA exit clause in his deal, Venice wanted something, you know, guaranteed until the end of the season. So they decided to go with different options. So Dwight Howard is still a free agent. And our job is to find him the best fit in EuroLeague, EuroCup, or, or BCL. Do you have your best fit for Dwight Howard? It, I have like, only one team in EuroLeague. It, it's funny that you're saying like best fit for Dwight Howard is the is Dwight Howard the best fit for that team? That's always the question. 
I don't really see a EuroLeague team signing Dwight Howard and giving him minutes. Even if he's in a good physical shape. Not even five or ten. I wouldn't I, I won't I don't five see him 10, as a bad player I, for the Euroleague. Well look, if, if if some team would be in a struggle right now, let's say two centers injured, you could sign him for a one month contract or something like that. Uh Kenneth Farid signed in Europe. A similar deal. I remember it was a one or two month contract mm-hmm. when um, Zaska had injury problems. Yeah. So maybe I could see that happening, but I I could see that. I, I would go lower. I would go lower with Euro Cup or BCL teams. Maybe there is a team that have a let's say an ambitious owner who who wants to prove something. And are we talking about owner? I'm not talking about that. Owning dude. a team in Vilnius. I'm not talking about that dude. No, no way. <laughs> Uh, not on this podcast. Not, not on any. Uh, <laughs> so maybe there's somebody who's willing to pay, open his wallet and say, like, look, we want White Howard, not necessarily for him to win games uh, for us, but maybe to draw some attention to us. Uh, I know who's willing to pay for guys, uh, but I mean, don't, I, don't I, really care about winning because uh, they just take a bunch of random players. There's who, a team in Euro Cup who is 1-8 and eight right now in, in Turkey. And Took Telecom? Yep. Okay. They mm-hmm. signed just a, basically five American guys. And they brought pretty Kyle randomly. Alman? Or it was Besiktas. No, Besiktas brought, sorry, brought yeah. in Kyle Alman. They had the Jalen Adams, Adams, who was not there anymore. They had Tyron Wallace from Paris. Stephen Enoch. Uh, Stephen Enoch from Basconia. Uh, Marcus McDuffie. Uh, so a lot of great guys, but they just mm. seem to be, you know... Not clicking together, not really coached well, you know, or or mm. I don't know. They're maybe they're not that coachable because they were not playing any defense, and by their budget, they should be way higher in the Euro Cup. But they're one and eight with the worst defense in the Euro Cup, mm. and I saw them live in Panevegis. Like they're not, they're playing ten percent on defense, and they they just care about individual stats. So maybe, you know, that team needs some. Need some guy who can jump and, and be a rim protector there, you know. Uh, I think, well, it, it's interesting uh, whether Dwight Howard understands uh, how different basketball is in Europe. Like he played in Taiwan, and if he's thinking that I'm I'm gonna sign in Europe and I will do the same thing, I will shoot some freeze. He participated uh, in a three point contest yeah, in Taiwan. Yeah, so it, it's not, it's just not happening. Uh, a year or two ago, I could actually buy into the idea of Panathinaikos signing Carmelo Anthony and Dwight Howard for spending five million euros for these two guys <laughs> to 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 join the Euroleague. But now it's probably not happening. <laughs> the only team I would see in the Euroleague, I don't think they will sign him at all. But like Basconia giving him like five or ten minutes. <laughs> Dwight Howard playing for Dushko? My God. I Basconia would love to see has that. A hi- that would be content, I would love to see that. Basconia has a history of signing Lamar Odom, so why not? I would love <laughs> to see I'm, not, that. I'm not saying they're signing him. I don't <laughs> think they're doing, but like any, maybe five minutes. Let's say if an ideal world, I mean, it's not an ideal world when somebody gets injured, but if Maccabi would have some injury problems with their front court players, I mean, they were the first who brought... No, Amar Stodemar went to Jerusalem before yeah, mm-hmm. joining Maccabi. He, he, he's a stakeholder in that team? He, he was. He was. He was. So, so yeah, I would kind of see that coming, you know, Dwight Howard joining as a short-term replacement for one month, for two, playing, of course, in Menorah Miftahim with that crazy crowd, you know, good marketing move and et cetera, you know. He's a content material in every mm. EuroLeague team. But other than that... Not sure. Not Honestly, sure to me, that, that, would be a marketing move, that so backup plan to sign in Australia sounds more legit to me. Probably. Although not many, there are not many openings. And it's not like they can pay much. So who knows? But yeah, good luck to Dwight Howard. Uh, oh, we have a, the riddle to solve. The riddle that Pan Haikos owner Dimitris Ganokopoulos came up with. So Carmelo so, and Dwight Howard. <laughs> <laughs> it might be your answer, actually. <laughs> so I just, uh, there was social media posts, or I don't know, it was an Instagram story or whatever, but I'm just reading what Eurohoops transcribed uh, from his social media. 
So, quote unquote, he said that together with our coach, Mr. Ataman, we have taken steps from now for two roster changes next year. Two players, each with a value of 3 million euros. I won't say who they are. You know them well. They're in Piraeus. I believe that our roster next year will be better than the one in tw- uh, 2009. That's it. Enjoy your coffee. That was the message. So he said that he will sign two guys that are playing from, uh, for Olympia Goss right now? Uh, they are quote in unquote, Piraeus. What does that mean? Uh, you know them well there in Piraeus. And for me, this was the main message. I think that potentially he was talking about two guys who punished Olympiacos badly in the previous years. Who punished Olympiacos badly in the previous years? Final four, semifinal game. Who hits the game winner? Who is an, on a team that without a clear future, if he's going to stay in the, the league or not? The former MVP, back-to-back final four oh. MVP, Vasily Misic. That's one. And the next one, you know... I'm not sure about this one, but he's on an expiring contract. He he will be one of the biggest free agents uh, next summer. Can we guess? Can we guess yeah. before you tell? Yeah. Because I had some names, but they, they were like all on uh, long-term contracts with their teams. Okay. But one guy I think doesn't have, and he's having a spectacular season. Uh, not sure about the spectacular season. He had spectacular seasons before, but what's your name? No, because I had Alec Peters. Uh, maybe... That's a good guess, but my guess was the the, the, the players who the player punished Olympia Cause. who okay. won the final four MVP award last year, and who who also punished Olympiacos in the final game at the Tavares. That would Ooh. make sense to me. His value also is going to be beyond three million euros. So, to me, these are my two crazy signing picks for okay. Olympiacos I was, next summer. I was trying to solve this puzzle in a different way. Okay. Who because, knows who, which yeah. way is right? So what was your I- idea, solution? You know, I was <laughs> thinking like... guys who were who played for Olympia Cause, at least. Mm, okay, why not? So I yeah. had like Wade Baldwin. Ah. But he just, okay, he extended the contract with Maccabi. Yeah, that's it. But you know, this whole situation is pretty unclear. Exactly. So who knows? But is he worth He's over 3 million euros? Kevin Punter. Yeah, it's not going to happen. What are we doing here? Just <laughs> look, Come on, man. Look, like a few minutes ago, you mentioned a dude who lives in Dubai and his stupid communication on his social media. <laughs> and I'm not taking that seriously. And I'm not taking Yanukopoulos seriously. seriously. <laughs> Whatever he's saying, like, why should I take him seriously? Like, one morning he wakes up and he decides to say some stuff. Okay, so I know that sometimes Point Nike was spends money sometimes they don't sometimes they sign big players sometimes they don't i don't know what he has in his mind maybe he even doesn't remember what he said two days ago so why are we taking these guys seriously and trying to analyze their statements encrypted messages yeah riddles are always fun so why not to have some fun on the <laughs> no, it's just it's just my honest answer i'm not playing this game okay okay <laughs> not participating fair enough fair enough <laughs> But so, your names make uh, much a more lot of sense. sense than... A lot of sense, man. Uh, for the last rumor mill stuff, we have Ettor Messina with some fresh rumors. I would say he might actually step down as the head coach of Emporio Armani Milan, uh, especially follow, following another loss in the Italian league, the fifth loss in 10 games. And f- what can I, I can also con- uh, confirm what I saw on, on Twitter. I think it was coming from, from Sportado, uh, Sportando first. Uh, he approached his ownership again, you know, with his intentions to resign. And from what I heard on top, I heard that they asked him to take a few more days and to take team through the double week because they play both away games in Munich and in Belgrade against Partizan. And I think that they have Virtus game next weekend. So they want him to finish, at least to finish this uh, job, let's say, or to go through this week and then before they're going to take some final decisions. So who knows, maybe he's just taking over the team in this, you know, heavy schedule and preparing the team for somebody else or he will go free and out and he will continue the job. You know, that, that might be two options. But uh, from what I also hear, Messina thinks about, you know, stepping down finally from the head coach position. I mean, finally, because he already approached his ownership twice last year and this year. Uh, what would be your reactions? 
well it seems inevitable honestly like what else can can you do you're not gonna reshape the roster in the middle of the season uh, you might sign a right driver for your team but it might be too late as it was last season with, with Shabazz so uh, the only way is to change the head coach and in other clubs it's it's normal it's it's routine like if you're not winning if you're not performing and you know that you have more quality in your team than the results are showing well you're changing the coach um, and we are all f for patience with coaches yeah. in yes. this podcast but in this case Do i think it just went for way too long I, I mean I, I think that they were patient enough yeah and mm -hmm. it doesn't make Messina a bad coach with all his experience and everything like I cannot imagine a head coach working for 40 years and never being in a bad situation exactly it, it is impossible so right that's now that's a good conversation we had before the podcast yes. even like Jelko Bradovic had those seasons in Fenerbahce or Panathinaikos without qualifying to the uh, top 8 it was the different system of top 16 as well but it would count as well as not making the playoffs any any legendary coach that has titles and honors also had some mm -hmm. bad moments and bad situations like uh, maybe you didn't sign the players you wanted. Maybe it didn't work out as you expected. Like we know that Messina has a lot of power in Milan to uh, pick the players and to coach the team as well. But like last season, they were heavily affected by injuries. This season, they're also having injuries. Uh, maybe some players are not really happy in his system. Some players are playing in their unu in unusual positions, let's say. And it's just not clicking anymore. So maybe it's 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 time for a fresh start. The season is still is still so going, still, and, and yeah, you can yeah. still you are two wins away from yes. You, you can position. still save your season in Italy and in Euroleague as well. It's just I read a tweet yesterday. Uh, I think it was by Marco Pagliericcio, but I might be mistaken uh, because I've just read so so many in 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 the night. But uh, some Italian guy said. Uh, that Milano might not even qualify to the Italian Cup uh, quarterfinals mm -hmm. because they're doing so bad at the moment in the in the Serie A and they have a tough five-game schedule ahead of them. Only two games at home and one of them is with Virtus and they need to win at least three, preferably four of those five games. And Mirotic is out. And by the way, they're playing. This team does not want to play anymore under coach Ettore Messina. And I agree with you. You know, he's not... Every successful coach has has bad runs and he's having one terrible one right yeah. now. But it's just the way this team looks, the, the game against Jalgiris. This team does not does not have a desire to, to be on the court. They're not having fun. I have not seen Olympia guys have fun on the court for I don't know how much longer time in the last couple of years and it's just it's bad to watch and these players have much more talent than they're showing right now and i can guarantee you if if you know if messina steps down this team are going to look completely different similar to what basconia did this mm -hmm. year and basconia doesn't even have that much exactly quality. exactly and they changed the coach that changed the mood in the team that changed some things obviously on the court as well but all of a sudden they started clicking. And it's not like Dushko, you know, is way better coach than Peñaroya, but he is a much better fit coaching wise for, for that roster. So, you know, Milano players, some of the players are not happy with the position. Some of the Italian players are not even playing in the Serie A. So why you even sign them? And then this is bad. So many bad things happened one after the another. And I think it's an unsolvable situation. And there, unless Messina steps down. And I actually admire how Milan managed this whole situation. I, I mean, uh, last year in EuroLeague was failure for Milan. And if I'm the owner of the team, if I'm the president, if I'm the decision maker, I'm okay with my head coach, especially if he's proving head coach as Etero Messina is. I'm okay with him failing and give him, giving him another chance. He, I cannot say he got another chance. He also, you know, created 
for himself this another chance in Milan he stayed he he had added some players but they're going through the same struggle and I think that's that's the turning point where you have to make a change they're going through the same struggle uh there are I cannot say there are problems in the locker room but you see this this body language of of, of the players and you feel that coaching change might uh might you know might flip the whole situation and and inspire for 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 better things so i think that they waited as much and messina uh, as well they waited as much as possible and now it's just a natural time for for mm-hmm. some change he's he's been on the bench like for four or five years already and that's huge in in the euroleague and that's normal that sometimes the the, the different era has to uh, kick mm-hmm. in but again who knows what if they win three games in a row you know then it's hard to make those decisions and they and they're they capable were close of doing to do that. That. like yeah. they won two games fs zvezda and then they faced Ralgiris. yeah and they were still treated as the favorites and they won for, against for fs and zvezda in pretty dominant way i would yeah. say so you know yeah. i wouldn't be surprised if they start you know pulling those they victories. still lost more than one in november so with Serie A. Yeah, I'm just saying that some good stretch can change the the whole mm-hmm. spirits and decisions right. in this case. Just to wrap up this episode, uh, we have uh, our segment uh, for all uh, favorite lineup for the previous EuroLeague month and what how your favorite all November team will look like. Again, it's not about taking best of the best, you mm-hmm. know, picking the MVPs or, or, or best players in each position. It's about picking players who you had some great experience of mm. watching and enjoying the criteria you, you can make up your own super criteria. personal super personal criteria so this month i just went with five best players basically. okay first month i went with five players that i enjoyed the most watching this month in november i went with i think five best players for each position and i looked at uh, their team's uh win percentage uh you know points plus assists what they do on the court, just basically impacting the court. So for point guards, I was choosing between Campazzo and Mike, obviously, but Campazzo, as Donatas mentioned in November, was number one in points plus assists, created 35, Mike had 29, Campazzo went five and one, Mike four and two. And obviously, you know, there are Madrid's overall are crazy, you know, like NBA team playing in the EuroLeague. But for the point guard, I went with Faku. Uh, for shooting guard, I had two options, Isaiah Cannon, Kanan, and Marcus Howard. And Marcus Howard was the top scorer in November, 21.3 points per game, 60% from the two, 43% from three points range. One, 10 three-point attempts per game. Yeah, so he made 4.3 uh, three-pointers per match. And just, I loved seeing Isaiah Kanan. And if this was my, like, favorite players to watch in November. He was my pick, but Marcus had an amazing month and he's my shooting guard. For small forward, Chima Moneke, 16.2 points per game, shooting percentages still crazy, 65, 56 from three point range. Basconia one with Dushko coming in, five and one in November. I have two guys from Basconia only for that reason. Power forward, Alec Peters, Ridiculous numbers, 19.8 points per game. Percentages, 65 and 59 from three-point range. Uh, also, impressive month. And for the center, Sergi Bak. Okay. What guys, what criteria did you follow, guys? And who do you who do you pick for November? I had Donuts. mixed criteria. Mixed. mixed criteria. Some personal yeah. favorites, some some best perform- uh, performers. Because in some situations I had my personal picks, but in some I just had to mm. be a bit more ob- objective. Let's go. Uh, with guards, I will go... This this is a completely personal pick. I will go with Leandro Balmaro. Uh, I didn't watch Bayern Munich enough, but uh, I loved his performance in Konas. And I just start loving everything about the guy except from his three-point shooting of course but i mean uh his body his size for the euroleague his his uh, ability to 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 be a playmaker to create for others also to play good defense the way he he's so aggressive on the floor uh he he's developing his mid-range shots pull-up jumper he can drive uh to finish at the rim i mean he has a lot of great tools to be great player a great future player uh, in the EuroLeague. Also, very coachable, very likable guy. A lot of potential, getting a lot of chances in Bayern. So, 
I enjoyed this opportunity to watch him play in, mm -hmm. in Konas and he was like inches away from get, hitting that game winner and it's sad that he got this injury in Lyon. Uh, the other guard that I have is actually Shane Larkin. Because Ooh. he had few big games uh, this month. Uh, first of all, he was one of the top scorers in November. 19.3 points on 54% from two and 39 from three. The top three scorer uh, in the EuroLeague in November. And also he had big performances in tough games and in important games for uh, FS. First of all, he called the game against Jalgiris in Istanbul with his uh, shots in Tough overtime. Shot of maybe. Then he, he scored 10 points in the end of the game uh, against Monaco to boost FS to this tough victory. And again, against Partizan, another big win for FS. And he posted 38 PAR, the highest performance of him in the post-COVID era. So I think that he deserved this uh, This. Big award to be in Donato Surbanas all November uh, team, and he was second in points uh, plus assist ah. in November. Okay, so okay, that's nice. And for my forwards, I have Alec Peters first of all for the impressive. Actually, I wanted to put both Kanan and Peters in this lineup because there were a lot of doubts who will replace Sasha Vedzenkov and Kostas Slu Slukas, who will be able to make that step forward and these guys they're performing i mean you cannot ask uh, more from them nope. and I'm, I'm really proud to see them performing that way uh, and you know the only thing that makes the, uh, them away from being considered elite this year just you know for olympiakos winning more games mm -hmm. or hitting some big shots in the end and that's it they have all the tools to be considered among the uh, greatest players uh, this year and that's a big improvement that both guys uh, made uh, so I just for that reason I put only Alec Peters in my five uh, because for the other forward I have very also very very personal pick. This is the guy who just gave everybody a good reminder of the importance of just boxing out people, and you cannot have such a takeoff for this game-winning putback like Jerome Blossom game had in Vittoria. It's yeah. just. It's, mm. it's, it's a had, criminal activity. I, I had Jerome. I, I will go with somebody really. else then to make it more yeah. interesting. But. So just for that reason, it's, it's good to see just him in general, you know, winning game for Monaco from, from this situation. And for my center, I have Bruno Caboclo. Uh, the way he entered the EuroLeague yep. with 19 point performance against Bayern. And his defense on perimeter was huge against Panathinaikos. I know that officials let a lot of contact in that game and especially in the end of the game. It was just huge, also defensive masterclass. I mean, Pat Nikos and Partizan game. And the way Caboclo played defense, perimeter defense and ISO situations at the end, it, it was huge. Not just blocking shots, but just closing all the lanes for, for guards to, to try to create a shot for themselves. Mm. So Caboclo was, was huge. And not only stopping guards, just my quick note about that. There was one situation where Dinos Mitoglu had the ball near the rim mm. and there was Bruno nearby and he didn't shoot a layup. He yeah. was like, Pump fake, pump yeah. fake, and I think either he shot it and got it blocked or he just lost the ball yeah. because there was like Caboclo standing near him and he was like, okay, maybe I have to think twice about what I'm doing. So his impact, although yeah. in, in the first couple of games he was struggling a little bit with his uh, individual defense, Caboclo, but now in in that Panathinaikos game, mm -hmm. phenomenal. So yeah, Rita's. Larkin, Bolmaro, Blossom game, Peters and Caboclo. Aye. Um, I'm actually going with really personal picks. Like so, my two time. guards no, are. <laughs> I'm gonna do some, something different this time. It's it's too easy to to do the same thing every week. Uh, I have Nicolas Laprovitola as one of my guards. Uh, his first game after the injury wasn't wasn't that great. Uh, then the others were, let's say, decent, mm. and then the last two games were off the charts. Uh, in these last two games versus Maccabi and Asphalt, he's averaging 25.5 points and he hit 8 from 10 uh, from free versus Asphalt. These are crazy numbers and before the injury, he started the season really well in the first four or five games. Uh, you, you could have him in your MVP discussion and it seems like he's getting back to, to his rhythm and he's one of the best shooters right now in the league according to the numbers and He's taking a lot of tough, high arcing shots, and at, also I have to say that he's uh, a really entertaining player, like, fun to watch. Uh, my other guard, Maodolo. 
Okay. Because just because I, just I because. couldn't imagine him having his career night this season playing for this team in Milan. You I mean if, if he scored 32 in some random game playing for Alba Berlin, well, that wouldn't be a shocker. But with this Milan team, where, where Messina is so strict, where you, you're not allowed to over-dribble the ball, you need to make your decisions quickly. And there's All, so many offensive uh, weapons yeah, that he has. Yeah. He's surrounded with, with shooters, mm. with players like Mirotic, uh, Falkman, and Shields. and Shields and all the other guys. And all of a sudden, he scores 32 versus Vesda. Yeah. And then the next game versus Jalgiris, he's gone. <laughs> so I, I, I think he will not he will not be even close to these numbers this season but this this one game just happened so i have him and then as my forwards i wanted to put jaron blossom game but i just don't want, I, I don't want to repeat the same thing so i'm going to go with with different options um timotelo Wukabaro. that's that's the underrated pick now he's a very solid euroleague player and this season in Nashville might help him to get a good contract for next year. It's not like he's gonna put Asphalt on 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 the playoff picture or or the play in. They will win some games. They got better when they when they signed Pozzeco. Uh There was this crazy Asphalt Bayern Munich game, also. But Luo Cabarro is is really consistent. He's one of their best players right now. Uh, he can play multiple positions, he can guard multiple positions, and he has the talent to score. He can play with the ball in his hands, he can be a spot-up shooter as well in, in, in the corner. So uh, I think that last season when he signed for Milan, it was not a good situation. Now, the way he's performing, I think next year we will see him uh, on a good team with a good contract. Uh, that's my expectation. And that's a very good pick because I had him as my honorable mention. He averaged 17.7 points in November yeah. on 50% two-point shooting and 39% three-point shooting. And I mean, I knew that he, he will be good in Asphalt. I just didn't expect him being so influential offensively. I mean, doing so many things, taking game winners you mm. know, in, in, in Colmas and this Bayern game. So he's having a great, great season. And then I'm picking another Barca player, uh, Jabari Parker. Jabari just because he's becoming a consistent mm -hmm. 10 point per game player like he, he has a really nice mid-range game and you can always depend on him to score 10 or 12 points and now he's consistent i i, I believe that he adjusted to the european game uh, he, defensively now he understands better what he has to do and roger grimau just trust him not always you will see him on the court closing games in the fourth quarter but also he had a big shot, I would say, versus Vesda. It was still in November, I think, so it counts. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and he scored 20 points in that game. So Jabari Parker and at center, well, it's tough not to pick Serge Ibaka, honestly. Mm -hmm. Not only because, uh, uh, because of his averages and the numbers, but also because uh, 10 years ago or... Eight years ago, he was one of my favorite uh, big guys in the NBA. So I, I like him as a player in general. <laughs> and now to see him being successful for Bayern Munich is great. And I also finished my lineup with Serge Ibaka. He was actually top scoring center in the Euroleague in, in the November. November, 15 mm -hmm. points per game. <laughs> Amazing percentages, 61.5 from two and 67.7 from three. Mm. Okay, okay. By the way, I think that Nemanja Nedovic is a honorable mention. Great month for him, uh, 17.6 points per game. And it's best won some some good games as well. So no, We're not going to have players in our lineups that block us on Twitter. <laughs> are, are we? <laughs> okay. You said we were doing personal picks. Okay. That's personal. So no James Nunley, <laughs> no Nemanja Nedovic. Actually, all these players blocked only Augustus, I think. So. I think I'm blocked by Nedovic. I don't know uh. why I, I never had a conversation with him or anything like that. Okay. You just wrote something bad on Twitter. I probably did. I do that sometimes. Yeah. Okay. It was great time together. Thanks a lot for participating. And that's a lot for listening to the podcast. Follow Basket News. Maybe they should, like, maybe subscribe. Uh, the people should write there all November. 
lineups in the comment section down below. Sure. Oh, so you want to read Olympia Cost and Panathinaikos starting fives? Let's go with it. Let's okay. Look, <laughs> let's let's give it a try, another try. Okay, okay. I'm pretty sure it will be like Caboclo, Peters. Mm, but they will Geran, not. Ger Geran Grant. They won't mix these guys. Oh no, 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 it's impossible. Like, what are you talking about? No, okay, no. we will we will take we will count the votes. So, you have to be active if you want your team to make the all November five of Urbonus podcast. <laughs>